Now, we want to go to talking about memory again, because it's very interesting. With C, we're very close to the memory on the machine, so let's think about memory. Let's go back to our old 4004 chip. Each memory location storing four things. Oh, and each memory location we call a byte. On this computer, the 4004, our bytes have four bits in them. Now we're switching up to the 8004, so that's going to have 8-bit bytes. If you wanted to store a number in there, like store 99 in memory, what does that mean? What's, what's 99 representing? If I'm storing literally 99 in there, or whatever it was, I can't remember, 01100011. If I'm storing that pattern in there, I'm storing the number 99, what does it mean? What does that mean? What, what's the meaning of that, the value that's stored there? Is it the number 99? Is that what I've stored there? It doesn't it depend on what comes before it. Uh, doesn't it depend on what comes before it? Yeah, or, or that's really good, Brad. Or, or to rephrase, it depends on how it's used. It might need 99, but it might need something else. Let's look at uh, the language C to see what I mean by that. In C, the way you're going to use something when that thing is, a, is a, 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 a something stored in memory is called its type. So if I have some, if I say so, for example, int x, I'm saying x is of type int. What's an int in C? It's an integer, so it's a whole number. So all the bits that are, so that sets an area of memory aside. All the bits that are stored in that area of memory, when they're fetched by um, the computer at runtime, or when they're used by the compiler, if it can pre-compute some things, those bits will be converted into a number that's a whole number. In C, how many bytes are used to store an int? We've got some fours. Four bytes to store an int. It, it doesn't have to be four. Four bytes is 32 bits. <laughs> when C was invented, it was invented, for a, um, it was invented to be a general purpose language. It could run on lots of different chips. So it could run on the Intel chips, or it could run on R4004, or it could run on um, uh, you know, a Z80 or something crazy like that. And in all those, they'd have different byte sizes. They'd have different amounts of memory. So C didn't want to sort of define how much memory in it was. It just said, look, it's a number. And it's up to the actual chip we're running it on and the, the, the actual compiler that we're using for that chip to determine how much memory to set aside. But over the years, most people used to use four bytes to store it. So in most people's minds now, when they think of an int, they think of four bytes. Though um, it's really important to notice that it's not always four bytes. So, say that again? So four bytes, not four bits. Four bytes. Yeah, so that would give you 32 bits. So that's a 32-bit number. And that's quite a large number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's up to billions. If we were storing an int as a four-byte number on our chip here, this is how much memory it would take up. You'd need a bigger chip. You can only store four numbers in no program or something like that. So our new chip, the 8008, we're going to say it's got 256 bits of memory, uh, 256 cells, and each cell stores uh, 8 bits, which is a number between 0 and 255, as we saw a second ago. If I stored some int, it would store it as a pattern of zeros and ones on our chip here. Suppose this is the number, I don't know, 3192. It might be stored as this pattern of bits on our computer. But just seeing this pattern of bits doesn't tell you it's that number. You need to also know, oh, it's an int, so we're interpreting it as an int. Because you could use that same pattern of bits to store something else. For example, you've seen that um, in your 4004 programs. Sometimes when you're reading a value out, it's a piece of data. But sometimes when you're reading a value out, it's an instruction. The same values mean data and instruction. It's really the context in which it's used that tells you whether it's literally, if it's the first byte being read out, it's the instruction value. And if it's the second one, it's assumed to be the, the data, right? So uh, same with all uh, computers. We store things in bits, zeros and ones always, but how we interpret them is entirely depends on the type 
of the data. So we've got ints, and they're normally four bytes long. If you want to use a bit less memory, you can put the word short. It's not guaranteed to use less, but usually it does. Sometimes it'll just use two. Probably on your computer it would just use two bytes. If you wanted to um, uh, uh, have more, and get it to spend more, you can put the word long, and that'll tell it to use more memory, but it, it doesn't have to use more, but it's guaranteed not to be less. Um, so you do this at compile time. Uh, if you, well, oh, okay, what's the effect of having more or less memory to store things? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, the effect of saying short, say for example, suppose on your particular computer you'd normally have uh, 32 bits set aside for an int. If you compiled it as a short instead, and so it only used, on, say, on your computer two bytes, say, it's not compelled to, it could still use four, but it can't use more than an int. It's guaranteed not to be greater than an int. Um, if it only used two bytes, and it can only store numbers up to about 16,000 or something like that. Oh, what's two bytes? 65,000. 65,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that means if you wanted to store the number 66,000, it wouldn't fit in. It would wrap around, suddenly become negative something. Yeah. So uh, whereas if you're using four bytes to store it, you'd easily be able to store that number and it wouldn't wrap around. So you'll get wrap around occurring at an earlier... So if you said long, then it'll set more memory aside. And often we do that when we're doing cryptography. Say we want longer variables to store bigger things so we can have bigger keys. So it's harder to brute force through all the keys. So we might store all our numbers as extra long numbers and use eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Though, though <laughs> um, we normally call uh, uh, really long numbers like that. We actually, instead of calling them ints, we call them longs. So you could say long x. The actual size of them depends on the particular machine. Most of you are using old Windows 32-bit machines or Mac 32-bit machines using Intel chips. Most of the compilers in those days decided to make longs as long as ints. But on other chips, they could be different lengths. So if you wanted it to be a longer, if you wanted to have the possibility of the thing being long and you're looking at your chip and, and the instruction manual for your chip, which we'll, I'll show you in a second how to find that out, you find that the compiler will produce something that's two bits long and you want it four bits, you could make it long. And then, if you wanted it to be really long, there's a thing called a long long for storing integers. Um, I think you should only use long and short when you need to use them. I'm just telling you them now so you understand there are many different types around. In practice, when you're dealing with numbers, you normally say ints. Uh, but if you're doing some sort of cryptographic application or something that needs really big numbers, then you st have to stop and think really carefully about what you're doing and, and use what is ever appropriate for the particular machine you've got. But yeah, normally the idea with an int is that int is supposed to be the natural size for the chip you're on. So the, co the computer, when it needs to load and fetch numbers from memory and move them to the microprocessor and then take them from the microprocessor and move them back to memory, it can normally move an int at a time. So if you pick something bigger than an int, it might take it a couple of operations to move it out and a couple to move it in. And if you pick something smaller, it's going to move an int's worth of stuff anyway, so you're not really saving anything. So an int is supposed to be the natural size. So, uh, yeah, normally we use ints. That's right. Okay, yes? You can also store floating point numbers, though. So you could say float x. And if I said float x equals 3.14 then the computer is going to set some area of memory aside to store this in. When you're dealing with floating point numbers, you normally say double, which is the next one we're about to get to, which uses twice as much memory to store them as the floats. The floats are normally not stored using much memory. It's four as a default. That's probably right. And then it's eight for the doubles. So normally to store floating point numbers, we'd store as it as a double. And to store as an int, to store a whole number, we'd store as an int. What is a float? Oh, so floats and doubles are numbers with decimal points. So ints are whole numbers. And so often in our programs in this course, actually, we'll mainly be using ints and, and um, longs. But floats and doubles, if you're doing financial maths or something involving trigonometry or something like that. So how many decimals can you store in those? How many decimals can you store in here? So, ah, ah, that's a good question. How does float work? Float's got a funny old standard. What it does is... Suppose you've got um, a float, and suppose it's four bytes, which is really 32 bits. Let me just divide it into 32 bits. How would you use 32 bits to store a decimal? Using 32 bits to store an integer is fairly straightforward. We just use binary, right? That, that made sense. How would you use 32 bits to store a decimal? Because 
if you want it to have 20 decimal places, then you can't store really big ones. And if you want it to be able to store really big ones, presumably, so what we're not going to do is store a certain number of bits, then the decimal point, and then um, the decimal point goes here, say, between them. We're not going to separately store the bit before and after the decimal point. Though that's a natural sounding way of doing it, because your precision here is constrained to be the maximum of that, and your maximum range you can get up to here is the maximum of that. Instead, they've got a much more clever way of storing it called the floating point way of storing it. And the floating point is the decimal point can drift around up and down. And basically, they store the digits of the number, as many significant figures, up. They use most of the bits for storing the significant digits of the number, supposing it was an integer and there were no decimal points. And then the remaining bits telling you where to put the decimal point. The bits for the exponent and one bit sign. Yep. Yeah. Oh, and they need to store the sign as well. That's right. Yeah. Whether it's a positive or negative number. That's right. So that's quite clever. It's called floating point arithmetic doing that. It's very complicated. And that means, well, it's not complicated. If you follow the rules, it makes sense. But it's slightly counterintuitive. And the rules are somewhat elaborate. There's a standard for it. But the neat, neat thing is to store this number as floating points would be a whole lot of zeros and ones. If I then wanted to interpret that number as an int, it wouldn't look anything like this number. That means uh, we cannot have more decimals. We have to have more significant figures. Uh, yeah, the significant figures is normally what you're interested in. This stores where, this just tells you where the decimal point goes. So, for example, to store pi, to store pi, it would do something like it would store as an integer or as a long, as a really big thing. It would store three, one, four, one, five, nine, two, six, five, whatever. It would say store that, suppose that's using up all its bits for significant figures. And that's this part, that would be saying store that number. And then this part would be saying put the decimal place there. So the number of significant figures is always constant, which is in engineering what we really want, and the decimal point just moves around. It's, it's awesomely cool. And you can read the standard for it for floating point arithmetic. You, you mean, can you change the, can you, determine at runtime how much memory you're setting aside. Yes, and we'll see that in a week or two. But it wouldn't be called an int unless it's um, in C. The type is like what we agree, is our protocol we agree up front. So when I'm storing some bits, and I'm passing, I'm storing the, yeah, there's some bits stored here, and I'm saying to the compiler, that's an int. That tells it how to interpret these 32 bits. And if I said it was an int, but really I'd stored 64, it would still only pay attention to the... Yeah, we can have variable length numeric types later on. Yeah, yeah, you can do all that. It's possible to store something and adjust its size dynamically and make things bigger and all that sort of stuff you can do. At the moment, we're just looking at the basic stuff. The advantage of that flexibility is that it's flexible, lets you do amazing things. The disadvantage of that flexibility is it tends to be slower, more error prone, a lot more programming work. So we only do it when we really need it. But sure, by the end of the course, you'll be able to do all that sort of stuff. But at the moment, we're just looking at the basic atomic chunks, and they are ints and doubles, or, or floats if you want, but I don't think anyone should ever use a float. I think a float's never quite big enough. Use a double, otherwise you get rounding errors. Oh yeah, good question. Can you ask me that in a second, we'll do it? So his question was, what if you set aside four bytes? What if you said int x, but then you assign 2x, your next line in the program, say, was something like x equals 1 really big number, what's it going to do? It might, tr it, might truncate, it might truncate it, it might wrap it around, it might do all sorts of things. Let's try and find out. Your question. Oh, yeah. Do you want me to talk about signed versus unsigned? Yeah, yeah. When back here... Is it still here? Oh, I've rubbed it out. Oh, yeah, okay, here. I'm saying this is storing the number 10, this is storing the number 11. I was able to, using just four bits, we're able to represent 16 different values, right? Between 0 and 15. What if I wanted to represent negative numbers, though? Add a bit. We can't add a bit. We've only got four bits. So we've only got um, 16 possible values we've got uh, available to us. With four bits, we can only, there's only 16 combinations of four bits, right? Yeah, with black and white. You had four things of black and white. There's only 16 ways you can arrange them. So whatever we end up with, at the end, there's only going to be 16 values. We're pretty sure we'll always want to store the value zero, because that's so useful. Before, we just used all of our 16 to go all the way in the positive direction, all the way up to 15. But if you wanted to store positives and negatives, well, what they normally do is roughly split them. So they go from here up to seven, and then down here to minus eight. Does that make sense? So 
Now, the way the bits are stored in here to represent these numbers is not the normal binary way. It's, it's something called two's complement. Yeah, yeah. For positive numbers, look the same. For the negative numbers, it's two's complement. So when you're looking at a number, you have to know how to interpret it. Is it an int, an unsigned int? Well, I just interpret it using normal binary. Is it a signed int? So it's got positives and negatives. Oh, OK. If it's a signed int, then all the ones starting with a 1, all the numbers starting with a 1, are in this region here. And I have to do some special calculations to work out which negative number they represent. And if it's a floating point number, then I divide the bits up in a different way to find the significant digits and where the decimal place goes. Every type has a signed and an unsigned version. So there's signed ints and unsigned ints. And if you go for an unsigned int, you can get more positive numbers. But the computer will get very upset if you ever try to go to a negative number. Oh, the default for int is signed, as you can imagine. If someone just gives you some bits and asks you what it's storing, to work it out, you've got to know what type it's stored as. And then you've got to know how the compiler represents that type on your particular architecture. Yeah. Oh, how do you specify you want it to be unsigned? That's a good question. You say, you say unsigned. Unsigned int x. And similarly, you can say signed in. How are we going? Oh, we're almost out of time. Oh, I didn't get to the exciting part. Let me just say it super quick. There's two other basic types that we haven't seen. One's called char, and that's for storing characters. Because computers don't just talk to us in numbers. They also talk to us in, um, in words and letters. So there's got to be a way of storing words and letters in the computer. So how we do that is... We say each letter is given a code between 0 and 255. Uh, so code number 0 corresponds to one thing. Code number 1 corresponds to another thing. The standard code um, that computers started with was called ASCII. And that says that this is all used for punctuation and crazy control codes. I think the first printable thing is code number 32 represents a space. Does anyone remember what an A is in ASCII? 65, is it? 65 is an uppercase A. And then 66 is an uppercase B. And 67 is an uppercase C. Yeah, yeah. And then the lowercase ones follow from that. Da, da, da. So you can store in, eight, in an 8-bit byte. You're storing a number between 0 and 255. Sure, but that might mean a character. Or it might be part of a floating point number. Yeah. The C character type is called char. If you want more than 255 characters, like um, for um, lots of Asian languages, they've got millions and millions of characters. And lots of European languages have little decorations on top or extra additions. There's a, there's a standard called Unicode, which lets you represent these bigger, this bigger range of characters using more bits. But it's not in the C that we're looking at here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, absolutely, you've got, to be able to, you've got to be able to represent languages for other countries as well. All right, so you've seen characters. You've seen floats, doubles, longs, ints, shorts, chars. But the last one we want to see is Boolean. Thank you to whoever called that out. We'd really like to be able to store a yes or a no. For example, we often ask questions that need a yes or a no answer. We might say, for example, if x is greater than 400, do something. x is greater than 400 is an expression. It's either going to be true or false. It'd be nice if, so internally, C needs to be able to deal with the results of these. It needs to compute this and at least internally store the answer to that question. And it might even store it externally. Like, for example, I might quite reasonably want to say something like, I might want to say this, Boolean past equals mark is greater than or equal to 50. I might want to say that. I might want to say, compute if mark's greater than or equal to 50. That'll give you a yes or a no. Yeah, yeah. Then store that in this variable called past. That's a reasonable thing to do. And then later on, I might want to test past. I might want to say something like, if past, do this. Otherwise, do something else. So in most languages, they have a way that you can store these Booleans, these yeses and nos, these trues and falses. But C doesn't. In C, we have no bool. There's no system to find bool. There's a kludgy way they tried to introduce it in the last standard that's actually created more problems, I reckon, than itself. So the only way we can store yeses or nos, how do you think we store them normally? We store them as a number. 
No. How are we going to store the value? No. Zero. How are we going to store the value? Yes. Any other number that's not zero. So if I said, are you, are you feeling good today? You could say seven. And what does that mean? Yes. Or zero. And that means no. So it's very wasteful because we normally store it as an int. And it takes up four bytes. I'd say here, int past equals mark is greater than zero. You'll see this in the type one spec because passed into one of the functions is something that says leap year. That's recording if it's a leap year or not. One or some non-zero number means it is a leap year. Zero means it's not a leap year.